a monthly webinar we have with Tina and Barbara from Live Binders and myself, I'm Dean Mance, and Mike Fisher will be our guest. So at this time, I'm going to turn the uh, show over to Tina and Barbara. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Knowledge Sharing Place. Thanks, Dean. You always do a great job of getting us ready here. And we're really happy to have Mike with us today. I don't know if you're there, Mike, but um, Mike was with us last year. We had a great time with you, and, and I, you know, I always regretted that we never had you sing your rap song for Live Finders. I don't so, think it's going to happen tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, next time we have you on, be prepared. But you did a great little, uh, I guess, lyrics to our to the features and benefits of live binders, and I always wanted to have you sing that for us. Now, be careful. That might be a poll question where we ask everybody in the audience if we want Mike to sing tonight. <laughs> All right, Mike. You didn't think you'd have to be on video, but you may have to sing. There's not enough wine in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I talked to Mike a little bit um, about what he was going to present today, and I got very, very enthusiastic and excited about the topic. So. I want to get Mike started on you know, what's going on with the web, how students are utilizing the tools that are out there already, and how do you tie that into the Common Core and what's expected. And Mike has put together an interesting binder of different tools, and he even has some examples to show you. So let's see, I need to move the slide down one here. Um, let's see. Bear with me here. There we go. There's Mike. <laughs> Oops. And what's our next slide? Did you add some new slides here that I? Here we go. So we're gonna. So in summary, here we're gonna do some introductions. Have Mike introduce himself, and then we'll go over. Mike's gonna go over what curation means and what are some of the Common Core considerations, and then we're gonna run into a, a live demo, and then we're gonna bring it back and, and let the audience take over and ask some questions for Mike. And we've invited uh, one other teacher who has done some curation projects with some students. Jeff Bradbury's here from TeacherCast, so he's going to share with us his experience as well. Does that sound good, Mike? That sounds great. Okay. So, and I see that my friend so Linda Mike, uh, has just joined us. Hi, Linda. So Mike is an instructional coach and consultant. He's the founder of Digigogy. So Mike, you're going to explain what that means if people that already don't know. And he's an uh, well, author. I, think I recognize like most of the people from Twitter that are already <laughs> that are joining. Oh, uh, okay. So so we've got a familiar audience here, but we have so many people that actually look at the archive later. So if you want to yeah. do a quick overview, okay. We'll let uh, you take well, over. <coughs> okay. Um, Instructional coach and consultant is what I do. I work with a lot of schools, especially here in Western New York, but I also work uh, nationally. And what I do is go in and work with schools around either Common Core initiatives or curriculum mapping uh, or instructional technology. I'm kind of at the intersection of of curriculum and technology and just being very articulate about what it is that we're doing with students and for students and forcing their thinking and moving it from you know the the 19th century version of education to the 21st century version of education and preparing our kids for their world. So that's what digagogy is really all about. Um, it's a combination of the words digital and pedagogy, and I put them together. And people make fun of it and call it diggitydog.com, and that's okay. <laughs> um, but it is it's just it's where we need to be right now, and and thinking about. Um, how 21st century teaching is going to impact our 21st century kids, and in terms of the Common Core, getting them to be uh, college and career ready. So there's a lot to talk about with college and career readiness and the Common Core, but um, we want to try to, to focus on, on certain things so that we can start having actions that are going to be appropriate for uh, what, we, what it is we need the kids to do. So. Hence tonight, we're going to talk about using the web for a specific purpose and aligning it from the Common Core. So, um, and it looks like, let's see, people are already talking about the Southern accent. So, yes, I'm in Buffalo and I have this Southern accent. So, if I say something that's too Southern, just let me know and I'll try to 
northern things up in, I guess, the appropriate northern way. <laughs> um, so, I want to start off by just looking at some facts. And I have a slide here for you that uh, discusses the average Facebook user creates 90 pieces of content per, per month. And that's on average. A lot of the kids create a lot more of that. 21% of the Facebook users are between 13 and 17. And more than 30 billion pieces of content are shared every day on Facebook. The source of this information was from a website called Social Media Today. And Jeff is already getting me off, off topic here with, with the jokes. <laughs> Okay, I can yeah. see I can see light <laughs> binders from my house. I, you know what? I can't even do it, so I'm, I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for later. <laughs> <laughs> but when I think about this data that I look at, um, you know, from these websites, and I'm looking at a lot of stuff online and just thinking about how it's going to impact instruction, there's a lot of implications when we consider that these kids are already sharing an immense amount of content. And what they're not doing is focusing it. And that's what we want them to do. We want them to be thinkers. If we're going to boil the common core down to one word, that one word is thinking. And I know that some people would disagree with me. They, they might say that it's content. But, you know, content does still matter. And it's one of the big common core capacities um, about them, about the kids being um, you know, engaging with, with content, but it's really about the thinking and what they're doing with the content uh, that, that really matters in the 21st century. So we want to teach them how to be discerners of information, to be selective about the information, because the reality is when we look at the Internet just as a whole, this, this slide is, is, is what it is. Getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot coming. And if we don't teach kids to be discerners and to be thinkers about information and to be careful collectors, I guess is, is a good short definition for curation, um, then we're not really preparing them for their world. And we're not really preparing them for what I call the any test, any time mode of thinking. Uh, meaning that if we teach them to be deep thinkers, whatever comes at them, they're going to be able to solve their way through it. And that's what we want. And it can start with something as easily as just using web tools in a particular way. So what I've got uh, to share with you tonight is, first of all, what the difference is between curation and aggregation. What students are used to doing is aggregating information, collecting it, just like in this picture here um, of a, like a storage shed. It looks a lot like my own storage shed. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just stuff. And it's not thinking about the connections between the stuff versus something like the picture on the left about choosing what is in a collection and being a curator. And I want to talk about this for just a second. Um, it's something that I talk to the people that I work with often, this notion of students being curriculum curators or content curators. Um, when you go to a museum, so just think about a museum that you've ever been to, you see a very, very tiny fraction of what they offer. And just, just the tip of the iceberg. And someone decided what it was that you were going to see. And that person is the curator. They made decisions about what they were going to put together and how they were going to make the connections, uh, perhaps over a particular topic or theme. And then on whatever day you decide to go to the museum and visit this curated exhibit, um, you probably are uh, going around the exhibit with a docent, someone who tells the story about what's been curated. And depending on the day, that story could change. And I think it's a really neat idea to, to want to think of our students as curators and docents of content, because it means that we're forcing thinking and we're forcing them to uh, make connections, not necessarily the same connections, because we want them to be divergent thinkers, um, <coughs> but, but really doing this for a purposeful, deep thinking way. And those
Those are the kinds of things that we can start aligning to the common core. Some of these skills that are in this list here about what makes a good curator are some of the same skills that we see in the instructional shifts and the uh, capacities that are in the Common Core document. Students need to not only locate good content, but be able to evaluate its worth and its relevance to whatever it is the, the task is. They need to be able to organize and connect the content so that it's as accessible as possible. We don't want them going in the library and picking three books and writing a report where they chunked out paragraphs of those things, but not be able to make connections between the pieces of information. Likewise, we don't want them to Google something and take whatever comes first as relevant information because Google's looking for particular words, and Google's not looking for the connections. Google's not a brain. Creating and repurposing content when it adds to the underlying value, we want them to be collectors initially, but then be able to take their collection and be able to do something with it. Um, <clears throat> for instance, when I was a kid, I used to collect shells. And one of the things that I would do with them is uh, if I had a bunch of extra seashells, I might make something with it, um, some little tchotchke or something. I mean, I was like seven or eight years old, so everything I made was cute, right? Um, <clears throat> but I would do something else with the shells. And I was repurposing these pieces that I had into something different. And just it's an inventive practice, and we can do this with the content. A good curator also has to capitalize on the social nature of the web to build connections and context. It's not just about your experience with the information. It's about your experience and the connections to other people's experience that are going to matter. And the more, the more connections we have, the more we're engaging the seventh capacity in the Common Core around cultural perspectives and perspective analysis. Um, <coughs> this allows us to build relationships with learners and other curators so that we're um, I don't know, we're, we're getting rid of sort of the, the staunch nature of what the teacher must be and the student must be, and everybody just becomes a learner. And I think it's a really neat zone to be in. And then it allows teachers and students to design uh, learning experiences that are way outside the zone of tradition. One of the things that uh, I wrote on the Curriculum 21 um, Ning not too long ago was about how strange it is that we ask students to be outside the box, and then we keep asking them to learn inside one. We still maintain our traditional things, but we're asking them to move beyond the tradition. Move beyond the tradition. So we want to move beyond that tonight, and getting to this right here, letting the students collect evidence, collect artifacts, collect content, and then tell the story of the connections uh, between those pieces that we chose. So I'm going to stop for just a second and see what's going on in the chat. Do we, does anyone have any questions at the moment or anything they'd like to put in well, here? Well, I do. I think you bring, bring up a really powerful point about the teacher and the student together have to step outside the box and be open to learning. And I think, for example, with live binders, there are many many of the great binders that are out there where the kids are exploring and coming up with their own content that they find is really guided by teachers who have done the same thing, who are also taking risks um, in the classroom and, and stepping outside that boundary. So it's, I think you're right. To really have that success, the teacher has to be a part of that as well. Well, and I think that's a new, um, like it's a 21st century like teaching mode. It's a 21st century teaching skill to allow the students to drive what's going on in that classroom. Um, when I do curriculum mapping stuff with uh, teachers, a lot of times I'm asking them to situate a journey and not necessarily define every single moment because I want some of that driven by the students. And the moment I start talking about the students driving instruction, that's when jaws start hitting the floor, people start sweating and just really not convinced that what I'm talking about is, is a good idea. Um, and I understand Linda just wrote about the new evaluations. It's harder for teachers to take risk, but right. I think those things are essential. If we want the kids to achieve at the highest level possible, then they have to do the work. And if the kids aren't doing the work, then what is it that the teacher is really facilitating? If the teacher hands them everything on a platter just to get that test score, um, 
perhaps we need to rethink roles in the 21st century. Um, a, a, good a good friend and colleague of mine, Silvio Rosenthal-Talasano, who blogs at languages.org, um, has a, a lot of blog posts on new roles for the 21st century. She did a lot of work with Alan November. Um, it's languages, like the word witches. Um, she did a lot of work with Alan November about defining the new roles in the classroom. Um, we've done stuff like this before with students. Who's going to be the reader? Who's going to be the writer? But now it's, you know, who's going to be the the moderator of the Skype? And, you know, 21st century roles like that. So it would be worth checking out her stuff, too, if you want to extend this even further. I even quoted some of her stuff, I think, on the next slide, actually. Well, somebody um, was asked saying, you know, they're trying to get their kids to curate um, just to collect rather, you know, before even curation could even start. Right. So I, I don't know. Did you see that comment there? Um, I did. I missed the comment, but I am going to address that uh, when we get to the actual binder uh, because we've the, I, that happened um, just in the moment with a teacher that I was coaching in North Carolina. So we're going to look at what actually happened with those kids and, and see what happened and see how this actually works. So the next slide here is just just to tell you that we've got some exciting opportunities here. Um, and we've got some opportunities for evaluating quality and relevance in, in what's coming. There's so much information out there. What we need to do is teach the kids how to be a filter. A lot of times, the teacher is the filter. And that's a whole other bandwagon soapbox I could get on. Um, and, and while I think the teacher is a good filter, um, teaching the students to be the filters is the better way to go. Putting this right into the students' hands um, is is where it's at. That's what's going to inspire the thinking. That's what's going to inspire the achievement. And that's what's going to get these kids college and career ready. So I've talked a little bit about the common core capacities. And these are uh, several of the capacities that I think are directly impacted by content curation. I could probably build a case for all seven of them. And if you uh, want access to where this is in the Common Core, um, New York actually has published their own version of that. So in one document, it's page five. The other one, it's page seven. So when you open the national document, turn to either page five or seven, <laughs> and you will see the seven capacities in the ELA document. But these three really stick out to me about um, what's going on with content curation. Kids are still building strong content knowledge. They're having to respond to varying demands of audience, task, purpose, and discipline. Um, in, in the past, the way that the setup would be is, you know, if the kids had to write something, the audience was the teacher. Perhaps it was extended to other students in, in the writing process. But we've got opportunities now to have multiple types of audiences, multiple perspectives, which actually ties into the seventh capacity that I didn't write here about um, cultural and, and culture and perspectives and just being a globally connected student. It's also giving them the opportunity to have multiple types of tasks within the web tools that are available. We're going to look at several in just a few moments. Um, having different purposes for writing, and that's really apparent in the Common Core. Um, students are shifting the writing from uh, less narrative stuff to more informational type writing and persuasive and argumentative type writing. And this gives them an opportunity to convince someone else that what they think is the right thing to do when they get to write from sources and they get to write uh, with specific pieces of evidence um, that, that should live in their writing. Um, as far as using technology and digital media strategically and capably, the hour of computer lab time on Thursday is dead. So there's something to tweet out. <laughs> um, if we're not letting the kids use technology ubiquitously, meaning it's like the pencil, it's like a piece of paper, um, it has to be an always available, ready to go resource, just like the things that we expect to see when we walk into a classroom. Pencils, papers, desks, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> that way the kids can choose when they need it and then when they're on the internet looking for content knowledge or making connections, they have some choices. And those choices are where we get the thinking and where we get into the thinking zone. 
So I want to talk about your toolbox for just a minute. I think the toolbox is very important, and I don't remember the last uh, LiveBinders webinar that we did, but I do several of these, and I'm always talking about the notion of a toolbox because it's really not about the tool. Um, it's about the task. Um, I've said in in other webinars um, to think about uh, going to the hardware store to buy a drill. When you do that, you're not going because you want a drill. You want a hole. And I think that's a very powerful notion to think about when we're thinking about what these digital tools look like in action and what they look like in the classroom. Because it cannot be planning for the tool. It has to be planning for the task. And then if we have the toolbox and it's full of tools, then we can always select the right one that's appropriate to the task. So the questions that are worth exploring here are, what tools do I use to curate? So that's going to be sort of our essential question for uh, the evening, and I'm going to walk you through some of, some of them with uh, some examples. And then being able to leverage your network to filter and find quality information, I'm going to show you what actual students have done uh, and their teachers, and then how can you contribute and become the filter for others. And the way to do that, honestly, is to pick any of these that we're going to look at tonight and join it and start playing with it and start curating your own information. This is from Sylvia's blog, and there's a web link here about students becoming curators of information. Um, <coughs> we had actually did a, a series about using uh, Web 2.0 tools, and a lot of it was Common Core related through the Curriculum 21 website. So if you want to go there and find out even more, I think there's four more hours of, <laughs> of this if you don't get enough of it tonight. So Sylvia and I created this slide uh, that we call the Digital Curation Toolbox. And I think at first glance, for a lot of people, this may be very overwhelming. <laughs> and so we're going to, I'm, I'm showing you this. There's a lot of opportunities for um, curating information on the web. There's lots of different tools. There's tools that are more interactive. There's tools that are specifically uh, there for sharing uh, content that has been curated. Uh, there's some that are on here that are just for collaboration, uh, including live binders. Uh, there's some that let one person be a filter, uh, and then in, even in these filtering tools, they allow commenting from other people. And I'm going to show you some examples of that when we look at the binder in just a moment. Um, and then some that are just strictly about information and sharing information. Um, even in the case of Facebook, uh, like a lot of times, we might have curated information, but it's a very surface level. I'm going to show you what that looks like in just a few moments. Um, so. Here we are at looking at some examples, and I'm gonna we're gonna look at some for about 20 minutes, and then um, give you a chance to ask some questions. But while I'm going through the examples, um, I'd like for you to consider sort of our essential question here: Why does it matter that students discern relevance for their collections? So, um, <coughs> Cat, if Pinterest is your bag, uh, you're getting ready to be hooked up. <laughs> I am going to switch to um, application sharing so that I can share my desktop with you. And I'm going to give everybody just a second to um, get here and make sure that it looks OK for everybody. Can everybody see the binder? All right. So this is live on Live Binders right now, and these are just some examples of ways to curate. And it also includes some student and teacher examples in each tab. So if you're new to Live Binders, uh, which I'm guessing most of you know it pretty well because you came here from that link, unless you came here from Twitter. Uh, but Live Binders is a great curation tool. It allows for collaboration. It allows for uh, writing, for not only picking a particular um, like web resource, but you have text options in here so that you can write about why you picked those text resources, or just give some additional information. And, and asking kids to be metacognitive about their choices is another uh, tool for deep thinking. Um, so what I'm going to do is click on the Live Binders tab here, and this gives you a general link to Live Binders, and then the sub-tabs give you additional links. And I'm going to walk through these uh, fairly quickly so that we have enough time to look at a lot of these examples and um, just see what we can see in the time that we have together. Uh, I am noticing that 
Dean is not a big fan of Pinterest, and Dean, I would just like to say that um, demographically, you're not who they're looking for. <laughs> I just read an article about how <laughs> Pinterest <laughs> is like really like they're they're looking for women to use this resource. But um, Dean, I think it was you earlier that said something about the the visual nature and about um, the learning association associated with the the visual. And Pinterest is so taking advantage of that. Like if we're going to talk about non-linguistic representation, I'm seeing like Pinterest pages for vocabulary where kids look for. Uh, like definitions of words, but associated with a particular visual, so that we have Pinterest pages of uh, vocabulary instruction instead of here's your list of words for the week. Good luck on the test on Friday. <laughs> so, um, but I'm 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 moving ahead of myself. I want to stick with live binders for just a minute. Um, I'm going to click on the first sub tab, iPads in schools, and this one's pretty overwhelming if you haven't been to it before, but this is the um, binder that I put together where I've curated the information. I've decided what's in my iPad museum, if you will, and I've created tabs around different things related to iPads in schools so that people can find information pretty quickly without having to Google the same information. So I've, I've put on my own exhibit here of, of iPads in schools, and this has been a pretty popular one. Uh, with uh, the live binder crowd, and I add to it often, so I change my exhibit. I add to the exhibit as time goes on. Um, another one that I just recently did is called annotexting, uh, where I talked about deep reading of text and evidence-based uh, questioning strategies, but using web tools as our annotation uh, facilitator. So these were specific tools that I picked for the task of annotating, evidence-based questioning, uh, and the deep reading of text. So um, you can explore this even more later, but these are my versions of what I thought would be good sort of exhibits for my, I guess, Digigogy Museum. I think that needs to be a new section of my website now. I just came up with that. Um, the next one I'm going to show you is one that um, I use often in PD as examples of what kids can do. This is called Social Justice Live, and it was part of a, um, a, a coaching moment with a teacher in North Carolina named Steve Fulton. I'm actually going to show you some of his resources for DIGO as well later. Uh, but he wanted to do something different with the writing for his um, eighth grade students, and so he asked the students to uh, come up with some social justice issues, and they chose a bunch of them. These were the top four here, cyberbullying, discrimination, child abuse, and immigration. And within that, what we wanted to do was turn the learning over to them, and not just say, you know, go to the library, find two resources, and write your paper, uh, because an eight-page paper to an eighth grader is like kryptonite to Superman. So he wanted to give them something that would engage them and motivate them to really do some deep learning here. And so I'm going to click on one of the tools, one of the tabs here, discrimination. And you'll notice there are sub-tabs here, Today's Meet, Wallwisher, and Google Docs. The Today's Meet, because it's been longer than a year, they have actually run out, and so there's nothing there on that page now. But uh, on the Wallwisher tab, this is like a corkboard type tool where students began to have um, discussions about discrimination. And what they did on this was they really just bantered back and forth. So this is the beginning of the deep thoughts, but the, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of depth here yet. Um, but this was sort of a scaffolded activity uh, for his students, and these were uh, in a school in Kannapolis, North Carolina. And these students had really never engaged in something like this before, but they were able to have a pretty decent conversation on the way to um, looking for relevant resources on the web. So what I'm showing you now is a Google Doc uh, that was opened up to them where they would just drop resources, and they had to put a note on here about why they chose that resource. This is the beginning of the curation. Uh, they chose a bunch of resources, and you'll notice this list right now only has four things on it. When we did this actual project, it had a lot more on it. And they came back in on the different uh, Google Docs that are represented in this binder, and they added and subtracted until they got a nice tight list of what it was they wanted to use for their resources. And then the students, I'm going to switch to the blog tab, then they blogged about what they did and their learning. 
So it wasn't this eight-page research paper. Um, they curated specific information, they had conversations about it, and then they blogged about it. And then they commented on each other's blogs. Did they still do the writing? Yes. Did they do writing for a specific purpose? Yes. Did they have lots of evidence that was relevant to their task? Yes. Did they use appropriate tools for the task? Absolutely. So this answered a lot of needs in this particular class um, for these students, and they really got into it. Um, the next binder that I want to look at is other student binders, and in this one, um, it looks like uh, Kat is in here, and uh, if I can... Yes, I added her in. She should be. Is that okay. the last one there? Yes. Yes. Um, can I stop right here, maybe ask Kat or uh, perhaps uh, Jeff if they want to pipe in here um, about live binders that they've used? Yeah, anybody raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> Jeff or Kat? Looks like Jeff said yes. So, do you have a mic there, Jeff? Uh, Peggy, are you, you going to give him a mic capability? Or can I do that? Let's see, what do I do? There you go. Jeff? I'm going to turn my mic off for a moment. Okay. Oh, I mean, teacher, teacher Cast, you're there with the mic. Can you, you just need to click on Talk, Jeff. Up at the upper left. Up at the top. No, we can't hear you. Okay. Maybe, um, perhaps we'll come back. Have you run an audio setup wizard and come back later? Okay. Let's. Um, I'm going to keep going, and then we'll come back to this at the very end. Well, um, I could talk about. Uh, oh, you want to come back at the end? That's fine, because I can talk about a couple. Cat, do you want to raise your hand and and talk as well? Okay. I can't, I can't tell if she has her mic. Well, just type in any time if you have the mic. So, do you want to move on to the next tab, um, Mike? Yeah, I can't hear Cat. If you haven't run the audio setup wizard. Do that, and then we'll come back to you on the back end uh, after I've talked about a couple of other tools. Or, or unless Kat has the mic right now. Have you got it? I, bear, yeah, I can hear okay. her. I just want you to go, keep going. Okay. Um, you can hear me. Just keep going. Okay. I'm going to keep going. We'll come back to um, Kat and Jeff at the end. So I'm going to switch gears to Pinterest. That's kind of the, the tool of the moment. It's been all over the news. Um, and what it, it's a visual curation tool. Um, and I would make the case that Live Binders is also a visual curation tool. But Live Binders is specifically like interactive because you're dropping an actual web page like right in there. So you can interact with it and never leave the binder, which I love for classroom management. If a teacher is curating, um, like I, I use these as like digital centers. Um, and, and talk to teachers about setting things up because then you've got the management there. You can look across the room and see whether or not a kid is doing what they're supposed to be doing <laughs> uh, for the most part. Pinterest, however, is the, this visual curation tool that lets you uh, comment but uh, gives you a link, a, a visual link, uh, to um, anything on the web that is collected around a particular topic. So what I've saved for you here, this is the uh, original page. and under peer critiques, the, the sub tab here, this is something that a teacher put together where the students have created these images in Photoshop, and then they came in and critiqued them, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. Um, you've got critical thinking, you've got an original creative activity, and then you've got kids coming in here to critique each other's work. Um, and one of the things that if, if this teacher was like, if we were coaching, uh, in a coaching situation, I would start to look at those students that are making good comments. Uh, for some students, it's, I like the use of the purple and gold, or this is cool. Um, what I would want to do is for the kids to start digging deeper. What is it that you notice? What do you think? What connections are you making? What new questions do you have when you're looking at this image? What opportunities do you see for improvement? Um, any limitations that you see? We, you know, some of that warm and cool feedback that we would use in protocols for professional development, because those totally can be used with kids. Um, 
but I'm loving the way this works. Uh, because the kids are making comments, and then I'm hoping the teacher lets the students upgrade and transform their work based on those comments. Um, but this is one example. There's another one that I found here around student research. And this is from a woman named Mrs. Difke. And what her students have done here is they've collect, they're starting, this looks like something that's just beginning, uh, but they're starting to collect and curate information around a particular topic, and their topic is a state. So if I click on L is for lobster, guess what state we're going to? Maine. So you've got something from the governor here. You've got something about Maine weather. Um, I'm not sure if it's said in here anywhere if this is a particular grade level or not, but uh, depending on what it is the, the kids are doing, I think this is a really cool website for starting with that collection phase and then deleting what's not relevant. So it, it forces some uh, thinking, I guess convergent thinking, like we're moving towards uh, like the, the focus on what it is we want and what, how relevant is it. Um, and it might be a good forum here for these kids to start commenting on what they think is relevant to the task. And then that might help them be uh, more or better thinkers around what they really need. What is it that is crucial and critical information here? Um, and then I will say, just to address like what Dean said before and what Jeff is just saying here, I had the Pinterest account for several weeks before I thought that it was worth anything. The same thing happened with Twitter. I thought Twitter was the dumbest thing on the planet, and now I'm checking it like 25 times a day. Um, Pinterest is the same way. It's allowing me to very quickly put resources together for things that uh, I'm doing. And uh, you can Google the Digigaji word. You can Google, I'm um, sorry, search in Pinterest for um, Digigaji or Mike Fisher 821. I save a lot of resources in there uh, around things like the Common Core, uh, student learning objectives is a new one that I just did. Um, as I find relevant resources, I like to put them together as exhibits, like in a museum, because I think it's a cool way to share information. I'm going to move on to Digo, and Digo is just kind of a way to uh, collect your favorite bookmarks, but instead of collecting them on your computer, you're collecting them on a website, and that way you have access to them no matter where you are. And I've used Digo for quite a while, and Digo has some other features, uh, such as highlighting web pages, uh, using sticky notes, um, saving little metacognitive moments around resources that you're sharing, and it has the ability to tag information. For instance, if I save a resource that's around Common Core, I would tag it with that word Common Core, and then I can just have sort of my just Common Core list very uh, easily accessible. I want to show you what this looks like in action with students. Uh, I'm going back to uh, Mr. Fulton from Canapolis, and he uses Digo for digital writing reflections. And um, actually, even though I worked with him when I was, whenever I was curating the information for this webinar, uh, this came up in Google. And I called him on the phone and said, you know, I Googled this like curation of resources with Digo, and your name came up at the top of the list. So I kind of thought that was cool because we had previously worked together with the uh, Live Binder around Social Justice Live. So he's using a lot of tools for specific uh, purposes. And I want to show you some of the stuff that they've done. He has a class Digo group. And in this class Digo group, the kids save resources and they comment on them. So they're not just curating to collect, they're curating for thinking. Now, uh, this looks like uh, it's about poetry, and the kids are asking questions about um, the things that they're seeing in, in these poems that they're saving. But I thought this was pretty cool. And part of it is because this kid right here, Weston, is the son of a girl that I went to high school with. So I'm, I don't think she's on here. But if she looks at it later, hey, Ashlyn. <laughs> um, but I love what these kids are doing here. Uh, they're, they're creating sticky notes on these websites. Uh, they're creating these metacognitive moments around their own learning, around things that they've found themselves. And 
this teacher has given them that control. And so it moves them into this um, zone of transformation, that I like to call it, uh, where everything is student driven and we're going to start seeing results in student achievement and we've also got a lot of motivation and engagement going on. There's another example of a, a class digo group where uh, students in the class and the teacher are responsible for uh, gathering these websites. And while this one doesn't have a lot of notes, there are some notations in here. But what I liked about this was it wasn't just about the teacher finding resources. It's about everybody finding resources. Everybody is responsible for the learning that's going on here. And I would argue that this is the beginning of what we might think of as the new textbook. Like, do we really need a text when all this information lives online? Could we create this together by curating the information? Um, here's another group um, in Georgia where the uh, teacher, I think, is sharing the information. And then uh, this one is specifically for uh, not just the students, but also the parents. And she's made some comments and stuff here. So this is, these are resources that she thinks uh, would be good for everybody to be, to be using. Uh, here's an example of curation around the topic of cyberbullying. And then the students come in here and tell what this website is. Um, and just give a, a real quick list or um, a, just a sentence or two about uh, what's on this website so that they can come in and be discerning users of the Internet, using the uh, Internet and technology strategically and capably. So, and that's what the Common Core is asking of these kids. Um, I do have, like with Pinterest, the, the last link that I showed you on the Pinterest page was a, sort of a tutorial. And I put a tutorial here that I put together actually a couple of years ago on social bookmarking if you're interested in learning more about it. I'm going to switch to another web resource here called Scoop It. Uh, Scoop.it is a website that does not embed very nicely in LiveBinder, so I actually have to jump out of the binder to look at it. But I want to show you what it looks like, just a student example. And it's like kind of an online magazine when kids collect information in this particular um, web resource. And let's see, let's try to jump out of it. I'm going to take the live binders off of it and see if I can get it to work like that. All right, here we go. So this is what it looks like. Um, in, in this particular curation tool, um, and it, it, it brands itself as a, a curation tool. It's visual. Um, it's not interactive the way that Live Binders is. It's more like um, Pinterest, but you don't have like a board that you're pinning to. It creates this like page that's sort of an online magazine. So this particular um, Scoop It page uh, was developed by students. Uh, one of them, his name is Zach, he's there, about hazards, health hazards, pollution. And they're collecting resources around all these different things. How excited would kids be if they were able to collect their own resources instead of reading the same information out of a book? So there's still a lot of text here. And there's a lot of different levels of text here. And one of the things that I think is really important is raising the, the reading level of what we're doing in the classroom. And informational text does that. The Common Core is asking for much higher reading levels than have previously been required uh, in classrooms so that when the kids get to college, they're not having to take a year or two of remedial uh, literacy or remedial English and language arts. They're ready. They're ready to jump right in and, and go because we've engaged this um, in middle and high school with higher level informational text. That's why one of the big shifts uh, is from the narrative and the literary to the informational. And there's things in here that were written by doctors. There's things in here that even the samples that are here, uh, you can tell that it's a pretty high level thing. One of the criticisms I get when I share stuff like this with teachers is this right here. Uh, Wikipedia still is a very contentious word for people. But uh, when you go to a Wikipedia site, and I'm actually going to open this one up and hope that it illustrates <laughs> what I'm getting ready to talk about. 
when you go to a Wikipedia site and you scroll all the way to the bottom, you get a list of references. And I think this is very important because this is its own curation here. It's an encyclopedia article. We could, this is its own sort of um, museum here. But it's got the references. And we want kids to be able to work with that. We want them to cite their work. I had a conversation with Linda. I don't know if she's still uh, in here. Uh, Linda704 earlier today about student citations and using web tools like the Son of Citation Machine to not only curate this information but tell us where they got it um, so that they're not just stealing when they do the creation and the um, remixing uh, of stuff. They're telling us where they got their information. They're giving credit where credit is due. Um, so let's go back to the live binder. I want to talk about one more issue and then get into some questions. Uh, there are some things in here that we didn't get to, but the binder is here and this becomes a 24-7 sort of professional development moment from now on. Anytime that you have time, you can come in and look at all of uh, these things that are here. And if you're interested in collaborating on this binder, uh, my web address is here under the Digigogy tab and there is a contact uh, place right here. If you want to collaborate, send me an email and I'll get you in so that you can add your own stuff to this and we can sort of curate together from now on. Uh, the last tab I want to look at is curation for PD and uh, one of the things that we can do just very easily is type in um, hashtags on Twitter such as EdChat and see all the cool things that people are sharing as they have this conversation about education. I'm using a service called TweetGrid because Twitter was giving me some problems when I embedded it in the binder, but um, this is just a conversation around educational chat. You can do, you can search Twitter like you search Google and find a bunch of resources that way. It's like an instant curation. And there's another web service called curated.by um, that actually integrates with Twitter and lets you curate things that you find on Twitter around particular topics. Um, there are Pinterest pages that I've dropped in here where I've put lots and lots of curation resources for you to explore and I add to these as I find stuff online. Um, I've got another Pinterest page in here of just Common Core resources because I was talking about the Common Core tonight and its intersection with this act of curating. Uh, Curriculum 21 has a clearinghouse of web tools and in this clearinghouse um, there's usually some sort of explanation about what is in here and there's lots of different tags up here of things to explore. Um, Paper.li, Paperly is a curation tool that takes people's feeds from Twitter and from uh, different places on the web and it puts them all together here as sort of a, a, a daily newspaper. So it's like an automatic curation um, web tool and which is, I think is pretty cool because it gives you lots of stuff to read and interact with around what this person cares about. Pearl Trees is another web tool that uh, has gained some traction recently and actually it was around before Pinterest um, but it's another way to curate and it's kind of along the lines of uh, Pinterest and Digo if you know they, they had a child it would be Pearl Trees. <laughs> uh, but uh, an internet buddy of mine Kyle Pace has written a blog post recently about this on ASCD so I dropped this in here as well so that you could come and see what Pearl Trees was all about because uh, there's a lot of professional development opportunities uh, using these websites as well. And the more you use them, the more you play with them, I think playing is a very important uh, skill at the moment when we're talking about web tools, uh, the more open you're going to be to letting your students use these tools. And I think it would be a good idea for you to get used to them as well. So that is my spiel. And we've still got about 10 or 12 minutes so that I can answer answer some questions or we can engage in some discussion about uh, what we talked about here. I'm going to unshare my screen and go back to uh, the Well, we were going to have uh, Jeff budget. talk about his binders real quick. Okay. Do you want to have him share the screen on his end or do I need to pull that back up? Well, I have it on mine unless, Jeff, do you have it up? Or do you want to talk to it, Jeff? Are you there? He's got the mic. We just
just don't hear you. Not up trying okay. to talk. Okay. Okay, well, we'll move on then. Sorry about that, Jeff. Okay, so, well, if we can get Jeff in, we'll we'll come back to that. Um, okay, Peggy, I can, I'll, I'll talk very quickly sharing. to it. I'll just talk really quickly to it. Uh, he had his music students do research on Beethoven. They went out and found information. They're doing, I think, the Second Symphony, and, and they were working through different movements. And so he asked them to collect information on Beethoven and about the symphony. And so they each created their own binders, and I put two on the shelf there. And uh, what was interesting is I actually got the opportunity to meet them and had them show their binders to me. So, you know, he asked for a few resources. Some of the kids did exactly as as he had requested, and other kids found some more interesting content that kind of added character to the Beethoven story in their binder. Um, and each kid did a different thing, which was which was very cool to see. But what really became interesting was when he gave an assignment to have them write, uh, I think it was a four-paragraph essay or four-page essay on Beethoven. And because they had already collected and curated all of this information, it was very easy for them to sit down and write this paper. And, and they found that the live binder, having everything there, having already organized it into some kind of an order, made sense for them. So it, it became a really interesting project and something that, that Jeff had commented to me. So. Well, an organization is a is a key thinking skill. Being able to organize it and deciding what to cut and what to keep um, is is very important in in the curation process. All right, other questions from the audience. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah. Okay. So. So well, yeah. So the other thing he brought up that was really interesting is that you know knowing that a lot of other people are looking at their binders kind of compels them to really be careful about how they're curating the content in the binder. Mm -hmm. So it, um, that uh, that uh, you know the public audience in some ways makes you be more careful about your curation. We we had some conversations in the chat about well you know we're concerned about it being public and so there's definitely minuses and pluses to to the public audience. Um, can I point out here uh, real quickly just another one of the binders that you had shared here, um, Tina, from Jason Schrag, Oswego 98. He created a template uh, binder that other teachers and students could come in and copy and then fill in with their own information. And I want to just pop this out for just a second because this is completely cool. He created the template and then the kids come in and they drop in the information here. It tells them what the task is, um, and then it goes through and asks them to come up with questions and answers along with resources that they've dropped in here as support and evidence of the answer that they gave. And this is some awesome thinking going on right here. And this is, you know, exemplifying the depth that we're looking for in the thinking of the students around uh, what the Common Core is asking for evidence-based questioning, for writing from sources, um, and doing things with specific evidence in mind to support uh, the thinking and the uh, claims that students make. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because he was experimenting at the time and what happened with that is, is the students took this project and really ran with it and the students here, Danny, came presented to us and he was so excited about all the things that he had discovered, you know, how he filtered through material. He even found a CIA website that had um, archived all of the secret messaging that went on uh, during the Cold War that are now public and available. So he really, really got involved in this project and I think the enthusiasm that came with the project was part of the plus for Jason. Yeah, it's it's awesome. It's it's just an awesome, awesome thing. I mean, this is a gift to teachers to be able to use something like this. And I I know over the last couple of years, just um, working with Tina and Barbara, like we've tried lots of different things out with the live binders, not knowing like what it would do, like the interactivity of it, and being able to make comments on things and embedding cer certain web tools. And we've really come up with some cool stuff. Yeah. Hey, if I can, if I may interrupt for a moment. This just kind of comes out of some of the chat that's taking place. You know, you're all talking about the student creations. As a matter of fact, I just had this conversation in our school district about e-portfolios. But the discussion going on in chat deals with students 
you know, creating their own accounts and live binders. So one thing I kind of put in chat, and Tina and everybody can kind of chime in on this too, is keep in mind that, you know, under regulation, the students, you know, 13 and under, as you got the COPA and SEPA, General Protection Acts, that kind of limit the ability to create some of those accounts using their own information. So a lot of teachers, what they'll do is if they have Gmail, they'll go out and create what I call a secondary account, and uh, it'll be a nicknamed type of account. We have the screencast on how to do that in the tutorial binder. But those are there are ways to work around that to where you can do that. I mean, like I said, we're looking at developing in our new tech plan that was just approved this week by the State Department in Kansas. We'll be doing e-portfolios for students starting in seventh grade, and they are to use it throughout seven through twelve. So that way, when they go to graduate, they have their portfolio. And we have a sixth grade teacher really wanting to do it. Well, you know, we're trying to explain to her about again the 13 and under, but how do we get students to be able to keep the materials they do? So, you know, we're in discussions right now, but that's something that those of you that are in the lower levels you need to kind of think about is if they're under 13, the creating of their own accounts. Okay, hey, Peggy's going to take the mic. You know, in the case of this, uh, the Cold War project, I think with his eighth graders, he they already had their school had set them everybody up with Gaggle.net, and then for some of our other students, yeah, the Gmail Plus is another way that they've worked around it. Um, you can also get email addresses pretty easily in Wikispaces. Um, it has a user creator if you're using your educator account, which is free, um, and it lets you generate email addresses. And even though the stuff comes back to uh, Wikispaces, there's still actual email addresses uh, that you can use for other things. Wow, good tip. Very good tip. So shall we move so, to the end of the slide? Hello? Is that, that Jeff? Does it work? It's working, Jeff. It's working, Jeff. You're on. Hi, everybody. Wow, that was a lot of work. Um, this has really, really been great and informative. Thank you so much, guys, for setting this whole thing up. Glad you could join, Glad Jeff. Could I'm join, glad Jeff. Can, although although there's an echo, so there's I'm going to stay off the mic. Off the mic. Um, my, my kids have been so amazing this year working with live binders. They've completely taken the ball. When I set up our class website, I stuck all of the Live Binders YouTube videos on our website. So the kids basically taught themselves how to use Live Binders. And they taught themselves how to put the covers on and how to make it. And, and all I did was basically guide it learning. And so they've done an amazing job with it. As I was telling Tina last week, the first project that I gave them is just to go and make a live binder about a topic that they liked. Could have been a rock band or, or, or cooking or anything. And that got them really interested right up from the start of how to use it, when to use it, why to use it. And then we moved into that Beethoven lesson. And I got to tell you, it's been really, really, really a, a, just a neat tool to have for these kids. And and that's why when we did our, mid our midterm project, I threw that Beethoven essay. They had everything right in front of them. Their essays turned out wonderful. And, and you know, looking at their hit counters, if they see that their Beethoven binder has been hit 95 times, they know that they didn't look at it 95 times and I didn't look at it 95 times. They are starting to understand that people like yourselves around the world are looking at their homework. It's been really, really neat for them to finally start to grow up and understand that we don't have walls in our classroom. It's, been a really amazing thing thanks to Live Binders. Thanks for sharing that, Jeff. Thanks for really, sharing that, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. All right, we've so got a nice there, little echo going on. So if you, I guess if you turn off your mic, Jeff, then the echo goes away. Okay, okay yeah, it's we're better back. now. Okay, so All we right. have some other questions too. RSS feeds from Wikispaces, that I'm not sure about. Um, you could embed like a, 
a blog perhaps um, into a wiki space and the blog itself would generate an RSS feed. And then I believe Barbara did, or Tina, you may know, the um, when you switch the binder to the like list view of everything that's in it, did is there there's a way to do an RSS feed of that, isn't there? No, but that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, and then Peggy's asking, how do you help teachers make the connection between what you're talking about and beginning to plan curriculum around Common Core standards? Good um, question. And by and large, when we do curriculum work with the Common Core Standards, I ask teachers to think about what they're already doing and how that's represented already with the standards, and then we start talking about transformations. Um, I want them to see, you know, what is it that we really need to start planning for and what is it that we already have in our practice that um, perhaps are opportunities for growing in terms of a, a different alignment lenses. Those alignment lenses could be aligning to the Common Core. It could be aligning to 21st century teaching practices and just getting the kids to collaborate and communicate and think critically. Um, or it could be specifically to uh, aligning to learning to use web tools for a specific task um, and being very task specific about what it is that we're doing with the tools and not tool specific. Um, so it um, it really is conversational. It, there's not a one-size-fits-all sort of way to connect the Common Core to things like this. We have to discover where people are uh, and then coach them through an action plan for bringing these pieces together and intersecting them. So let me see what Peggy's saying here. They've been trained to think that if they don't have standards, they don't have to worry about Common Core, but that's not true. Even though it's just ELA and math right now, all subject areas are expected to be integrated. Um, all areas are expected to be supports for literacy, specifically. And if you look at the Common Core document, uh, the first 43 pages for K-5 teachers is about um, ELA literacy in um, in ELA, but also in science, social studies, and technical subjects. Technical subjects means everybody else, uh, including art, music, PE, science, social studies. Everywhere that teaching is happening, literacy has to happen. One of the things that a colleague of mine, Jean Trebuzzi, has been telling people in her workshops is thinking about our mission statements for, for what we want out of our students, these big ideas for things at school, and how awesome it would be if we could all come to consensus about a literacy mission. And what would that literacy mission statement look like for everybody in the building to buy into? Um, but that's that's what the Common Core is, is asking, literacy support in all areas. And the last few pages of the document are the uh, literacy standards for 6 through 12 teachers uh, for science, social studies, and technical subjects. There's a lot of more specific uh, grade or grade specific standards that relate more to uh, the technical subjects so that it's not necessarily uh, as, I don't want to say vague, but uh, in, in the regular ELA standards there's the, I don't know, there's there's some things that are still open to interpretation, but there there's less interpretation necessary in those standards for 6 through 12 teachers. So, you know, uh, tell me if I'm completely in left field here, but would, would examples, I mean, obviously we're using different kinds of tools today, so are teachers mm -hmm. really needing examples of how to make those connections? I mean, there's a, isn't there a fear factor of, oh, well, if I just grab a tool and try to do something with it, how do I know it's meeting these standards? How do I know that it's engaging literacy? But our teachers, I mean, when we worked with paper and textbooks, were there always examples that teachers could grab and then modify from? And are there enough examples in the digital world for that? Well, one of the things that I'm doing right now as I curate topics, so people are asking right now in the chat, um, you can actually find, go into my live binders. My shelf is embedded in the leveraging for the Common Core binder. Uh, the last uh, tab are my binders, and there's things in there for LOAT teachers, for physical education teachers, and there are examples of unit plans aligned to the Common Core that feature literacy. So I know in the, the PE plan that's in there that was written by a buddy of mine, Bill Shesky, in South Carolina, um, it was written for a project for New York City for their mapping project through uh, Heidi Hayes Jacobs' company, and we had to specifically go in and align it to the core. And his is on um, the the fitness journals or something that the kids are supposed to keep. 
Um, so there, there's a lot of thinking. It's, it's an, kind of an overwhelming lesson plan if you're not used to unit planning that way, or unit plan. But um, there are some examples there. On Pinterest, I've saved things for, um, I think music teachers is on Pinterest, art teachers is on Pinterest. Um, no, art is on Pinterest, music is on Scoop It. So there are some unit plans that are in there. So you can see some examples of what this looks like in action and what we're talking about. Uh, for these teachers, because honestly, with these teachers, we also have to have a conversation about what text means in their class. So the art teacher, text isn't going to be like it, what it is in, in ELA. You've got pieces of art. You've got sculptures. You've got visual arts. Those are things that can be analyzed. Those are things that can be recreated once we notice all the, the uh, ins and outs and facets of what it is we're looking at. Uh, in music, music itself is a language. That is the text. There's a lot of vocabulary on written music. There's a lot to interpret and understand and discuss and analyze and recreate. Um, and I would make the same case for PE. Uh, I told a teacher the other day that he was the text. And he wasn't convinced when I said that. But you know, if, if him observing students doing what he asked them to do and he shows them a procedure for something and then they demonstrate their understanding of it by uh, doing it the way he showed them and, and paying attention to the rules of the game and being able to articulate that through listening and speaking, that is how literacy lives in PE. So we, you just have to have conversations with people and, and help them to understand where literacy lives in their content and how they can really transform it to be a support for kids so that literacy is living everywhere so we can really uh, prepare them for college and careers. So you said you have a, I mean, you have in certain places examples of. I've got unit plans all over the internet. Pinterest, Life yeah. Finders. I wonder if um, you should, you know, you talked about your museum and your exhibits and your galleries. I wonder if specifically well, and actually, for examples um, in different categories. Heidi Hayes Jacobs. Heidi Hayes Jacobs has an open um, site, and while I'm talking about it, I'm going to go find it right now and drop it in the chat box. Um, and well, I found it very quickly. It's a public uh, mapping website called Rubicon Atlas, and this is is public for the for folks to view. But when you go in here, it'll ask you uh, just to click the Browse tab up top, almost kind of like a Live Binder tab. And when you click Browse, then you can dig into um, Common Core aligned units that uh, live in this public system. So you can see what this looks like on different grade levels and different content areas. Some of these are a little overwhelming for teachers who have not been part of a curriculum design process before, but it's, it's there for you to view and hopefully get something out of. <laughs> and I certainly would be willing to answer any questions about it if, if people looked at that and wanted to talk about like critical pieces of curriculum, uh, alignment lenses like to the core or to a, um, a particular web tool or something like that. So. Do you say that's the biggest challenge, Mike, that you see in here across the board? I think the biggest challenge is I don't know, comfort and consensus and collaboration. A lot of C words. <laughs> um, people uh, in general like their comfort zones. And if that means that there's, if a lot of growth has to occur, then it has to be approached with some finesse. You don't want to tell people that they're going to go from 0 to 60 tomorrow. Uh, good work, systemic change, those kinds of things have to happen slowly. And we have to bring people in. We have to do what uh, uh, Heidi has these four phases of curriculum work. And the, the biggest piece is laying the foundation and make, getting people on board. Because if you, if you come in, like the Common Core inspires people to want to jump to more rigorous things and uh, to do things at the very upper levels of blooms. If that's how it's going to happen, then you're putting a roof on a house that has no foundation. And so we need to work it from the bottom up and bring people into the fold, talk about what this is going to look like, give them opportunities for sharing and collaborating and creating new lessons and new units together uh, through these different alignment lenses and in terms of any like district initiatives they might have, uh, and then learn how to advance that work over the course of time uh, so that when we get ready to put that roof on there, we've got strong walls and a strong foundation. Sorry. 
I'm typing away here, Mike, but I... <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's it's a hot topic on the chat session, so you're you're hitting a nerve there. Um, were there any more questions about the use of the tools? I mean, I think I think we've really hit the core of it, though. <laughs> the core, the common core. The core, yeah, that's C, the C word. <laughs> the common core. So uh, well, looks I like think Robin every, is asking Mike if you got her letters. Yes, actually, she's, she's had her students write uh, persuasive letters, and although I did not uh, get to read them all in depth today, I did get them. Robin is a phenomenal teacher, and she works here in my area, uh, and she has uh, a special ed student. They're self-contained, and she is just she's a marvel. And she really cares about her kids deeply, and she's doing a lot of good stuff. So, um, I, I think she's a phenomenal teacher. Glad we, I'm glad we got to meet Robin today. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. So, um, somebody move to the next slide here, and this is if you're here and you need professional development hours, uh, usually um, Dean talks to that space, but. Um, we have a link to a form, and you can uh, fill out the form, answer some questions, and then we can we'll send you a certificate for spending an hour with us. And then, if you want to take a look at all the goodies that Mike has put together, here is the Bitly link to the binder. And I think we copied it in the chat, but I I can try to copy that again. There it is. Peggy oh, there got it, it is. In there. Okay, thank you, Peggy. And, uh, so, uh, Robin, give, we'll uh, hook you up with Twitter eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Should be on Twitter before anything else. Absolutely. We'll get her hooked up. Cause I, I know her and I know where she lives. So. <laughs> okay. You can't escape from us. <laughs> so I, I want to thank you guys again and thank everybody that joined us tonight. Um, this is what I do, and I really enjoy it, and um, I like being able to talk about it and converse about it with people, and hopefully you've got something to add to your toolbox tonight. So, I definitely I have some things to add. Thank you, Mike. It's always fun to have you on and always informative. You come up with some great stuff, great presentation tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and in with us tonight, I... Uh, Appreciate everyone taking time out of your Wednesday evening and collaborating with us. Be sure to visit the uh, website back on the live binders, learn more, and you'll see the webinars subtab so that way you can get to each and every one of them. We'll have this binder and the video recording of this in each of those binders. And again, I want to express our uh, gratitude to Steve Hargadon, to Kim Case, Lorna Constantini, and Peggy George, all those from Classroom 2.0. Room live for uh, working with us and helping host or co-host this uh, monthly webinar on uh, Blackboard Collaborate. So again, uh, thank you for attending the Knowledge Sharing Place, and we look forward to seeing each of you next month. So pay attention to the banners as they come up. Have a great evening, everyone. All right. Thanks a lot, and thank you again, Peggy and Tina and Barbara. I will see you online soon, I'm sure. Okay. Thanks again, Mike. Have a good evening. All right. All right. Take you care. too. Bye-bye. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.